electricity is colossally expensive compared to natural gas. Natural gas is the cheapest form of heat you can get, but bureaucrats uh, are, are determined to get rid of it because it causes greenhouse gases, which of course itself is all nonsense. So we have nonsense built upon nonsense. I don't know when this house of nonsense cards is gonna collapse, uh, but it could be pretty soon. <laughs> because when you burn methane, it does, it's not the same methane after you burn it. It turns into something called water vapor, right? And when did, yeah. a, cloud, when did a cloud become a, a dangerous thing on our planet? Good afternoon, everyone. You're going to like the interview we have today, Larry Pierce. You know, we had done an interview about two years ago after I reviewed his book, A New Little Ice Age Has Started. And that was one of the top viewed video uh, podcasts at that time because we we're both in the same stream of looking for reasons why the climate was changing so much, looking into longer cycles than the 11 year cycle. You're looking back at 800 year cycles, 1200 year, 5,000, 3,600 year cycles. And then how this whole agenda was being pushed for a global tax initiative. And here we are today again, because we've seen the world spin on a dime. And uh, if you're interested in the publication that Larry released that brought us to our first interview, you can still find that on his individual website, www.lawrencepierce.ca, or you can just jump right over to Amazon. A new little ice age has started, how to survive and prosper during the next 50 difficult years. And then also something that we're going to need to rely on is repairing our own uh, devices and homes and bicycles, for example, anything that breaks that normally you would take to have somebody repaired. We're going to have to think about being more self-sufficient in repair and uh, different self fixes. So, and he also has the two volumes here, The Art of Fixing Things, part one, 150 tips and tricks to make things last longer, as well as The Art of Fixing Things, part two. Now, as you see in our world jump forward, we have the economy. You're gonna have to be more self-sufficient, growing your own food, canning, uh, jobs lost, the supply chains disrupted. You're gonna have to start fixing some of your own things but it all revolves right back into this. We, I personally feel this whole thing we're seeing, this mirage out here and, and grand play is because we're at that point now where next year the harvest is going to be so minimal that there'll absolutely be incredible food spike in terms of prices, but also inavailability that would start off the first catalyst for uh, social instability in the cities because of the lack of food. And that's why we're coming together today. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Larry, welcome. Thank you for joining me once again to talk about this very important subject. Hey, thanks, David. It's uh, always good to talk to you. Yeah. So how do you perceive the world? What's happening at the moment? How do you think? And how do you think this is more related to this, the grand solar minimum and the, the crop losses that we're experiencing? And really, the government's trying to mask it. So they don't have to claim culpability and they didn't warn the citizenry for the last 40 years. They let us kind of run into the brick wall on this one. Well, I think it's a, the world is in a terrible state. We have, for the most part, certainly in Canada, uh, we have completely incompetent leaders. In the States, the Trump administration uh, seems to be more on top of things. But um, what we're seeing with this virus scare I'm not sure whether or not this is ultimately going to be another global warming uh, fraud. Uh, although I think with the virus, you've got enough bodies now piling up to convince even the worst skeptic that it's real. And how we got there is really irrelevant. I mean, a lot of people are spinning their wheels on you did it, no, you did it, and pointing fingers. The re reality is that we've had these kind of things. We had it with the Black Death. We had it with the uh, Spanish flu. Uh, humanity will have more of these things. It's just, it's inevitable. We have to fight them as best we can. But in every situation, there will always be people who will try to grasp a little more power. For example, 
here in Canada, um, the Liberal government tried to grasp king-like powers to tax and spend as part of a uh, COVID-19 relief package. They had worked into the legislation somewhere on page 900. The, the ultimate power to raise taxes and spend money without parliamentary oversight. Now, this is exactly the kind of thing you got to watch for, because when we have troubles, there'll always be creeps who'll pop up and try to, you know, make uh, make more uh, muscle for themselves. These these problems like COVID-19 or the new little ice age or global warming, they're going to give us choices that we didn't have before. And I think we've got to work towards less government, not more, open societies, not closed, and um, more local food production. Those are the three things that seem to be the most important, in my view. I would totally agree, but it seems like it's about 180 degrees of what you're talking about right now in terms of everything needs to be more controlled at the moment. There needs to be more government oversight over every single aspect of lives at the moment, even down to in, in your home, if you're coming out on to step onto your grass for sunshine. It's gotten to the point now where, you know, you're talking about the economic uh, never ending taxing and spending. Well, here in the States also, they put up that the treasury is now going to buy back all of the issuance that it puts out. But then at the same time, if there's any distressed equities and companies, they're going to buy back instead of having the companies doing corporate buybacks, our government's now going to buy those equities and BlackRock's going to take hold and start cataloging. So our government's taking ownership of private companies. They're requiring now that companies produce for the state and anything that's produced money wise or offered out there on the market, the treasury is just going to buy it back. They're just going to continue. The Fed's going to continue to print as much as it needs. So I don't think the balance sheet will ever end. And then, you know, when government starts to control all private enterprise and have it take control in the means of manufacturing, we've slipped into, we've slipped into somewhere we definitely don't want to be at that point. Canada's doing it. France is doing it. Spain now needs to do it. Italy's looking at it. America just did it. Australia's on the bandwagon to do it. So where do we go with this? Whatever's everything is becoming under the control of the state in terms of private equity. It's incredible what's happened. And it's, 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 gonna, it's never going to end. It's stealth communism. Stealth it is. Yeah, that's a good word. It's communism and it's, and it's yeah. form, isn't it? Yeah, it is stealth communism. I mean, uh, the, the globalists have been working for decades to try to um, pull this whole thing together. And if you don't believe in the, the globalists and their new world order, there's tons of videos on that. Well, not tons, but there are a few good videos on the net uh, where these clowns actually talk about it. And uh, we just recently saw Tony Blair, uh, former British prime minister, say that we needed some form of global, global governance to beat this virus problem. That's what it's all about. And it does sound like theory until you hear the likes of uh, George Bush the first talking about the new world order and how we're we're gonna have it you know it's still out there on YouTube look it up yeah I've seen that one before and you know yeah uh, and then Gordon Brown remember he was an older PM not over in, in the UK too he he echoed exactly right after that uh, same echo chamber out of the UK we need a uh, temporary global government to combat this thing. And then you know what? Just the very next day, then the, the French leader called for the same thing. So it was See, like guys, everybody's parroting each other. And I don't know what's happening with Merkel in Germany, but they're, they're doing the backhand thing there. Where now they want bailouts, but they wouldn't give bailouts to the rest of the countries like Greece, for example. Now they're asking, oh, no, you know, now Germany needs special treatment because they're in a bad conundrum. But no, they didn't help anybody. What happened to Portugal? What happened to Greece? What happened to Cyprus? Nobody lifted a finger when all that went down economically. But Germany needs special glove treatment now because they're in, <laughs> in a, <laughs> backed into a corner. You know what I mean? The yeah, whole charade yeah. is falling apart. Yeah, they don't have Britain to loot anymore. Uh, yes, the, that's true. The, Treasury's the gone. UK was the UK was the banker for the EU for a long time, and that's why they tried so hard to keep them in. 
they finally got out and uh, just in time for this COVID. Now, my daughter just moved here from uh, London. I live on a little island here in British Columbia and things are pretty good here, pretty stable. Uh, but she's, she talks to her friends back in London and God, everybody's losing their job, not because of Brexit, but because of this virus. Uh, the tourist industry is shot. Um, they're having trouble getting food. One of her friends goes from shop to shop, sort of like Venezuela style, you know, to try to get some reasonably priced food. <clears throat> um, but uh, the UK is in is in pretty desperate straits in a lot of ways. Uh, hopefully they'll they'll pull out of it when this virus problem is over. I uh, frankly I don't know what to think about the severity of it. I know it's very contagious, but um, whether it's as serious a thing as they say or not, I don't know. But they sure are using it. They're talking about lockdowns. Well, we got lockdowns all over the place. It was it's the perfect disaster to assert more control and you have to question at every step whether or not this level of control is necessary you know my dad while i was sitting down with him earlier and he started going through state by state and how many there was so you know in hawaii there's one case but they closed the entire state down for one case yeah i know it makes no and, sense. Like, you know, things are just so far bizarro here. Okay, I get it with New York City. I get it there. Yeah, right. I understand. This is a hot spot, and there's like an enormous amount of things sweeping through. It's, it's close quarters. Uh, it's just a very different situation than in the middle of Montana where they're locking farmers down in their fields going, you're a farmer on a 10,000-acre ranch. You're still not allowed to go out of your farm and sit in your tractor and go till the field by yourself. You're just not allowed to do that. You have to stay in your house. Like, wait a second, Montana had like 12 cases in the whole state and Hawaii with one, yet they locked those entire economies. See, there's something far more nefarious going on with this whole movement forward. It's almost like retraining the populace. You know, we, yeah. we both talked about not enough food in the future here, your book and mine both. And yeah. it seems that it's right now is the grab, the, the excuse, the play to grab the global, global food supply. Because if everything else breaks down, you know, because now the truckers aren't allowed to go across borders, but guess who's going to jump in and magically rescue and drive for them? The military. They're going to accompany every food shipment. Oh, wait, where did we hear that? Oh, yeah. Maunder Minimum, England, 1650, every single food shipment was accompanied by the military. Now, we'll fast forward to today. Guess what? Military wants to plow the fields. Farmers can't go out. Military wants to take control of the warehouses. They want to drive the food, too. Yeah, and then, you know, you, as you look across the planet too, India pretty packed, China very packed, Taiwan, yeah. you know, all of Asia is really densely populated. But when you come into other places across the planet, it's some of the least populated per square meter or per square kilometer on the planet, and they still want to lock it down, which makes zero. Okay, if they're worried about the spread of these things, they're, they're you know, just in my opinion, it doesn't feel right. Uh, everybody's on this whole timeline since we've been talking. And, and know what we know about uh, this whole cycle in the sun driving on 400 or 800 or 1200 year cycles. It seems that all the things that they've been talking about with reduction of air travel to clear the skies, reduction of road travel to clear this, the roads, no pollution, no ship traffic. It's all like thumb screwed into place right now. And then, you know, all this driverless technology comes. Now, if there's no cars on the road, they can put the AI drivers out there to deliver all the foods. And, you know, they wanted to transition over to an AI run economy where the workers are redundant and get rid of them. Well, now they're trying to push in universal basic income. I mean, it all fits the whole profile of everything right now, but it's all based on that underlying current food, food or not enough food. Guess what? The 5G, which is is an information transfer system, is um, so powerful and so big that from what I've read of it, it is uh, mainly designed so the machines can run remotely. So, you know, we're, we're headed towards a machine world run remotely through 5G uh, without a lot of human involvement. It's starting to sound like a Terminator movie, you know, but guess who's gonna get terminated? Thanks for building me, don't need you anymore. It's kind of like <laughs> China. Hey, thanks for building yeah. up all the factories in our economy. We don't need you anymore. You know, the same thing, yeah, whether yeah. it's China or AI running the thing, 5G. Interesting. Yeah. 
there's right. always gonna there's always gonna be people trying to seize power, and they become more skillful at it. Like I firmly believe there's a war going on and has been for some time that is just invisible to the average person. It is the powers of globalism trying to seize control through frauds like global warming. We know that's a fraud. There's no doubt about that. And you're right. One size does not fit all. The uh, the, the model for tai, Taiwan should not be the same as for Montana. Uh, there's two different, entirely different um, situations in those two places. Uh, one thing I did want to talk about is, um, is food. Now, uh, one thing we're going to have to have, have both because supply chains are being interrupted and because of the uh, continuing uh, global uh, sunspot problem, the grand solar minimum, which, by the way, has brought both hot and cold like it did uh, 400 years ago. It has disrupted things. Uh, I mean, people don't realize that, yeah, a sunny day in January is wonderful for everybody except the plants. The plants don't want sunshine in January. They want it in June or July. So when the weather, weather is totally disrupted, we're going to have to find new ways to grow plants. Now, one of them is going to be... Um, uh, outdoor growing with new styles of greenhouses and, uh, and new styles of insulation are going to be very important. It's interesting that I wrote a book about the new little ice age and then along the way I had this great idea for a new kind of insulation. It's the first smart insulation to come along. It's based on a vacuum. It can be controlled. The, the amount of insulation you get or whether you have insulation or not uh, is determined by temperatures and inside and outside because the vacuum can be either increased or decreased, which would increase the, the thermal resistance or decrease it. So the walls can go from R25 to R5 just in a matter of minutes. So it's possible to build a greenhouse that will let the sun come through and when evening comes, the uh, the vacuum's increased, and the the thing is, the, the whole building is sealed up tight. So this is something new. I got a patent pending on it, and I'm hoping that it will make a difference in terms of our ability uh, to to stay warmer in our homes and grow crops. And if I could throw a little something in there during that new stimulus bill, tucked back, you know, like you said, page eight hundred in the back somewhere. Yeah, there's a stipulation for vertical agriculture and those who want to take on loans to start up new businesses in vertical agriculture for skills training as well as the produce uh the vertical you know and the infrastructure you know in terms of the hard tubes in there and pumps filters water and all these things that you need with the fertilizer the seed to get preferential treatment for that for a zero interest two-year loan and then they're also coupling it with hud to be able to take over uh, distressed mortgages on buildings or those that are being foreclosed on where there's no bidders in there to be able to, if you take over that property and you install vertical ag in it, they'll pay it the whole way and you don't have to do anything or pay anything for two years. Now this is a caveat that's in the new bill and there's still need to expand upon it, but uh, the, the lettering's inside there to allow, and see, I found it real strange that they, specifically pushed for vertical indoor agriculture. And I was thinking that's, you know, when I, we talked about that for ages, like indoor ag is where it needs to go. I was talking yeah. about coal mines, uh, parking garages, disused shopping malls, commercial properties to switch it over. And then here we are, there's something in a bill actually at this perfect time right now to get people incentivized to move over to vertical agriculture. I don't know. It's, it's a little... When I saw it, my jaw nearly dropped. I was like, no way, we're being played right now, especially with this inside there. The transition's begun. It's absolutely begun into bringing our agriculture indoor for what we're losing outdoor, which is going to continue this year further. The planting's really behind and still super wet like last year, if not wetter this year. Well, it's good to hear that. It's good to hear that there is some support for the these concepts and uh, – with better, cheaper insulation, like my insulation, for example. I call it freedom insulation because 
it is as cheap as fiberglass, but will give you six times the insulating uh, abilities. So, you know, it's it's a great product for putting into buildings, some of these buildings that are poorly insulated, disused, whatever. You can retrofit really fast and easy, and uh, suddenly you've got a warm space where you can uh, grow food. Now, I'm looking for a manufacturer to make the stuff. I don't want to make it myself. I, I've done my last new business, I'm afraid. <laughs> I've sort of burned out on new businesses. But um, that's that's a good move to see that happening. Vertical uh, agriculture where you're, you're growing stuff inside, it's great stuff. Yeah, now the question is, can you scale it? And what are the solutions to combine? Okay, you have new R value, insulation. A friend of mine is doing some tape, the same thing to, you know, because people are looking for really, um, you know, easier fixes to, to solve problems because as we see right now, there's a lot of changes going on in the economy. People staying at home, they're probably noticing there's more things in their homes wrong than they would have if they're running off to work eight hours a day or 10 hours a day. And they're looking for different things to fix, especially with our value based things, whether it's too hot or too cold, there's leaks in the house, there's leaks around the doors, around the windows. And uh, you know, beyond that simple fix and we you know something more tangible that you're talking about, I mean, how long is it going to be before power grids start going down? They're not going to be maintained, as we saw in China. I'm sure the same thing's going to happen along the way. The coal wasn't being delivered. The, the staff got too sick. The senior staff didn't show up. So they were relying on junior staff. They pressed the wrong button. Boom, the power goes out. Okay. Now what? You know, we're going to have to think well beyond just growing food indoor. We're going to have to actually think about, you know, the next winter coming up because they're predicting a full-on wave two of this lockdown again, people sick again. But uh, what about the people who are running the base utilities and, you know, how literally insulated are you, no pun intended, from the problems outside in terms of temperature? And uh, these are things that we need to think about, especially if you're growing food indoors, you better not lose your temperature so everything dies off in, inside. You know, there's, there's a, a plethora of things. And I'm just curious the way that you think these two might mesh together moving forward as a set, you know, pre, as, a, as a coupled technology system with vertical ag, new types of insulation, and then uh, the structure itself? Well, I call my, my insulation freedom insulation because it, it sets you free from, first of all, heating uh, and cooling bills because your house can be insulated so well, so cheaply, that you don't need external energy inputs. Um, you need a little bit to to drive a few fans and a, uh, a vacuum pump, uh, but that can be obtained from the sun. And you're also getting freedom from some of these crazy government schemes where crony capitalism has more to do with it than uh, good solid economics, where they, they uh, make a deal with some company to, to provide wind power or or pixie dust power or something and they set these things up and they don't disclose the real costs and uh, they have feed-in tariffs and you know that's all going to collapse sooner or later consumers need to be free of government schemes and and big energy companies and all these people that are trying to get their hand in your pocket because that's all they do they figure out another way to to do it and if you have properly insulated your house, you're free of a whole bunch of stuff. If you properly build a greenhouse, you can grow food outside uh, in the coldest climate without uh, investing huge amounts in uh, big, expensive greenhouses and fossil fuel to heat them. And a quick FYI out there, anybody who I encourage you to look on the net, especially YouTube, there are uh, several videos now of people growing. They have hinged double hoop, regular raised grow beds. So, I mean, from the very simplest of what you can do with two door hinges and some PVC piping to be able to extend your grow season and keep it through exactly what you talked about. They went through an entire winter when they were in Northern Michigan, going through an entire winter and they were still growing greens like basil and lettuces and these kind of things in those during the middle of winter all this last year yeah 
Yeah, that's great, isn't it? Yeah, it really. Yeah, it's going to be an enormous amount of these innovative solutions coupled together for people to move forward. Maybe you don't have the means to, you know, put out a 10,000 foot and square foot greenhouse. You know, that's pricey. But what yeah. can you do in your backyard with some lumber and a couple pieces of sheets of plastic? Innovation and, and common sense will get us through. And of course, governments don't have that. Governments have bureaucracies that are forever trying to gather power. They don't have guys like me who say, well, uh, how can we do this cheaper? And how's this going to work in the free market? That's what you really need. You need to have people that look at the free market and say, is this going to fly? Or do we need some sort of ongoing subsidy to make it fly? Like electric cars, for example. I don't think you could possibly sell an electric car unless something along the way was subsidized. They just, they're just too expensive. And the, uh, the, the energy that, they, that it takes to run them has got to be the same, except, you know, the pollution is all in one place. Speaking of energy, there's this crazy move now to uh, disconnect natural gas from new buildings. The, uh, both the Vancouver and I believe San Francisco have uh, come out with new rules that new, new build um, housing cannot have natural gas in it. It's got to be electric. Well, this is just the stupidest thing you could ever imagine. I mean, electricity is colossally expensive compared to natural gas. Natural gas is the cheapest form of heat you can get. But bureaucrats uh, are, are determined to get rid of it because it causes greenhouse gases, which of course itself is all nonsense. So we have nonsense built upon nonsense. I don't know when this house of nonsense cards is going to collapse, uh, but it could be pretty soon. <laughs> because when you burn methane, it does, it's not the same methane after you burn it. It turns into something called water vapor, right? And when did a, yeah. cloud, when did a cloud become a, a dangerous thing on our planet? It's just absurdity built upon absurdity, built upon a crooked uh, media, a, a fake news media that takes their orders from I don't know, from I don't know from who. Now we got a government here in Canada that's not taking their orders from the people. Um, the first two people to come visit our new prime minister Justin Trudeau were Ban Ki Moon and George Soros. That's got to tell you a whole lot about what he was all about, what he is all about. You could write a globalist playbook based on what this guy's been doing to Canada. He's been killing the energy in industry and impoverishing the people, uh, giving money to the third world. He's a complete nut. And um, that's, that's what's going to happen if you let these guys in power. And again, you know, you talked about the free market there for a second. You know, companies are meant to fail if they're just shysters and they don't have a good product and it doesn't work and it can't fit and they're, yeah. it's an overrun on budget. And th these are meant to fail. But with all this new money spending and money printing, any company, no matter how ludicrous or outrageous or how failing their ideas are, it's just going to be propped up at the trough. It's never going to fail. Nothing's ever going to fail. As long as they ask for money, they're always going to get it because there was two jobs they're going to save. Maybe not now. They're yeah. all, all working from home. But you can see this... Um, you know, never ending debt squeeze coming in there and the credit crisis with the liquidity and all these, um, you know, hundred and something billion worth of U.S. Treasury sold the other day, the highest amount ever eclipsing. And I think the last amount was like 29 billion in a day. It's like 103 billion in a day. People are like exiting to try to get some liquidity. And uh, it's just a free for all print as much as you want. So I don't know if any company will ever go bankrupt again. Is that, I mean, you and I will. They're giving us a, me yeah. a measly paltry. What are they going to give to American citizens? A paltry scrap of a breadcrumb of 1200 bucks. Yeah. But then they bailed out the, the companies to something like 4.5 trillion. And they're giving you like a, a measly 1200 bucks. It's, it's, I'm really trying to think of words for it, but. Uh, well, crony capitalism has never worked. The free market does work. And the sooner we get government out of the marketplace, the sooner we'll be safe. And if they won't do it, we have to lead the way and do it ourselves.